This time on the laboratory, we got the holiday merry-go-round for Mr. Christmas. Matter of fact, we got two of them uh, that were sent in to have repaired, and they came with notes on each one. This one, of course, you can probably read it. It says, no rotation, music, and lights. Music, lights, horses go up and down, all fine. This one runs and rotates, horses go up and down, lights very erratic. Well, I think there's a bad connection. Uh, there's a flag that goes in here. This one, the broken flag, is in the box. This one, I didn't look for the flag. I'd, it might be in there. But there's supposed to be a flag that goes right up here that pops out. So, we're going to see about uh, opening these up and trying to repair them. Let's see if I can get this, this piece out, at least. That way it matches. There we go. There's the bottom. That way it matches this one as far as what's going on. So, this one I'm going to assume has a bad motor uh, drive belt or a bad gear. This one... Yeah, it's probably a corroded connection. So, why don't we plug the one that supposedly works okay, except for the lights, and see what it looks like. Because I haven't. 90% of the time when I do these videos, I don't test them before I turn them on for everybody else to see. So, it's the same surprise that I see as the same one that you see. Well, it is working. I'm gonna turn some lights down to get a better idea what it looks like. But I see what he's talking about on the lights. Apparently, it doesn't like to be tipped. Might have a slipping gear as well. Yeah, it's very jumpy. Where's the volume on? Volume. The horses are going up and down, but they're just as erratic as the lights. And you can maybe see on the edge that it does stop every once in a while. Oh. You might be able to hear it too, because ba 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 ba. That probably indicative of a slipping belt. So, let's try this one. I thought the top might have rotated too, but apparently it does not. Well, this one sounds better. And you see the horses. Look at that. Those horses are moving perfectly. And it sounds so much quieter. I don't know if you can notice that. I'll turn that one off. Bring back some light. And let's unplug the power supply. So, this one's in better mechanical shape, except for the drive. This one's got a lot more problems, so let's open this one. Uh, and then we'd, it would just be mirrored onto this one. But I probably won't film them both because they're going to be the same repair process. But I wanted you to see I got two identical ones sent in from the same person, as a matter of fact. Both of them have failed in their own way. Uh, but this one sounds better, and it works better except for the spin. This one seems to have more issues. Uh, the... Jittery motion is probably a broken gear or slipping belt. It could be electrical, um, where whatever's causing the lights is also uh, surging the motor, which is a possibility. So we're going to open the one that says very erratic. So bear with me for a moment. I'm going to go put this one away. 
and make room for this guy because these things are rather, rather large as you can tell <laughs> they're not small carousels so be back in just a moment and we're gonna tear into this mr christmas and see if we can get this one fixed and then i'll do this one off camera but they should be very similar in the process since they're the exact same piece okay the other one has been put away safely so it can be looked at here is a closer inspection of this monster it's actually pretty heavy too let's see this thing is a little over 12 inches in diameter about 12 and a quarter and as far as height goes in case you want to get one it is about 11 inches tall so and it's got a lot of mass it's actually pretty heavy here's the bottom you can see the big speaker grill uh, another speaker grill but this i can see some of the mechanism so it might be used for cooling we got the four feet and then down the four holes is absolutely nothing they're just probably reinforcements to hold some of the mechanism and then we got a couple of screws right here to hold in the plate for the volume on off and power and Christmas or all year round songs. Pretty standard for the Mr. Christmas collections. And let's see, this one have a date on it? Nope. So, this is Mr. Christmas holiday go around. There's the official sticker. Like most, I'll start from the top. Right down in the center is a Phillips screw. So, let's uh, take this screw off to start. Then there's a threaded boss on the inside. And let me check around the edge. There's probably got some clips. Let's see if we can get this canopy off. I need to see if it comes off as a two-piece or a one-piece canopy. It might be a one-piece. One piece. When I say two-piece, a lot of times the center section comes out and leaves this outer ring. But this is a one-piece canopy. So I'm going to push that back in so I don't lose it. And set it off to the side. And here is the rotor for the lights. And these, this rotor assembly is really gouged up. And very, very dirty. Because this rotates and we need to send power, they use a rotor board. And that's what I'm going to call it because when I was a kid, they called these rotors on bicycles and scooters, which allows you to spin the handle without uh, severing the brake lines. Well, on circuitry that rotates, you need to have two contacts that spin. They have very similar things in your steering column, too, of your car to allow the horn to work and your steering wheel spins. If there's a wire in there, just get wrapped around the steering column and You'd have some problems <laughs> so but this is really gouged it's hard to see on camera there's a shiny silver spot on each one where the spring-loaded contacts are pushing in the lubrication the dielectric grease has dried up a long time ago and there's little pieces of it just balled up with the dust and it has literally put grooves into these plates which is amazing which means this thing got used a lot because uh, I don't see too many with the rotor plates that are um, that are gouged. So, that is most likely our erratic lights. The noise you hear is just the rubber feet bouncing on the rubber mat. It's not broken. But let's plug it in and uh, check this rotor assembly out. volume off.
So let's uh, use the its own inertia here, its own movement to clean this rotor pad. Now I'm only doing one track at a time because if you touch the two tracks together with a liquid, such as alcohol, it creates a short. You can see some of the gunk. And we don't want to create a short. <sighs> That's tough on the electronics. But this stuff is really on there. Normally I'd use the oversized cotton swab to do this, but there's a lot of gunk and I have to go through several cotton swabs to try and get this cleaned off. I'm actually putting quite a bit of pressure on it, which is why I turned it off. I didn't want to destroy anything in the moving part. Should be able to see it starting to clean up on the uh, camera. I'm just using isopropyl alcohol. It's 99%. I buy it in the gallon. Uh, isopropyl alcohol is good for cleaning many a thing. Electronics is especially good for. Um, helps with removing corrosion, uh, grease, grime, dirt, dust. I am going to have to turn it on though to get it past this uh, rotor contactor. So I can clean underneath those. So I'm going to turn it on in just a second, have it rotate just a little bit. So you don't have to buy this big stuff if you want to. Um, I got it from Amazon. And we're going to be setting up an Amazon link setup, hopefully this week. This is the week between Christmas and New Year's, um, for the new year. So you know where to get the components, the tools, the chemicals that I use to help with this. You don't have to buy them. You can buy something different or buy them locally if you don't use Amazon. But since Amazon is the biggest, you can get them on eBay too, but the only reason I use Amazon for a lot of these is speed. Sometimes they're more expensive, but I can get it in a day or two, while eBay is generally um, a week or two. So, what I'm doing now is I'm shoving it underneath the contact just to wipe the bottom of the sweep. So, I'll leave a little mark. Now the contacts are cleaned, there's still a groove in them, which of course cleaning doesn't remove the groove. Let's see if the lights are a little bit better. Hey, the lights are actually staying on now. They're not flickering and they're not a... I spoke too soon. You can tell when the lights come on because you see how slow it is, and I'm going to disconnect the light. You hear the sound difference? So it's got a heck of a draw. So before I lubricate these with dielectric grease, I want to get inside the motor mechanism, which is going to be in the bottom. So this whole drum is going to have to come off. And I prefer not to be handling a freshly greased set of contacts. So, because it's Mr. Christmas, and like most carousels, you got to take this nut off right here, which they have uh, hard glue as a, uh, a lock, so it can't back off. So, need to remove this glue. Which is always a treat. Uh, Limax. They usually use hot glue, 
which makes it so much easier. But Mr. Christmas uses, um, I'm assuming they're using super glue or they're actually using a type of Loctite, but it's clear. So I always call it a glue because most Loctites that I see are, are um, blue or red, green. They're not uh, white, they're not clear. So. Now I usually put these back together with super glue. I'm oh, sorry, not super glue, hot glue versus super glue in case they ever have to be serviced again. Um, everything breaks. So I try to make it so it's easy, easier to service in the future. But before I start taking it apart, let me uh, bring you up to, you can see in the center, that uh, shinier groove on both of them. That's where it's digging into the rotor. And that is a lot of use to do that. That or it just got so dirty and dusty it just acted like sandpaper. Since uh, it's pretty rare to see them. So, I don't have standard pliers here at the moment, so let me uh, use my long needle nose and see if I can get this thing to start spinning. There we go. have to desolder and push down these wires to go inside uh, because this assembly isn't going to come off even though it's got notches for the wires the wires aren't long enough to lift it over the top so uh, sometimes they do this one doesn't Not that I should forget, but I'm going to put a little black mark here to tell me that the outer ring is the negative. Kind of important on LEDs that the positive and negative are in the right direction or they don't work. Our soldering goes it's easier to desolder something if you put some fresh solder on it it helps uh, transfer the heat so you can take the uh, solder ball that's existing and it'll break it down easier but they use one long solder joint there we go Rotor contacts are out. And just to make sure these uh, ends are good, we're going to just wipe them off. Oh, wow. Alrighty. I'm going to show you. That's an interesting belt. I am going to show you the inside of this drum. A lot of carousels, if you've seen any of the ones I've done in the past, they have a contoured section that goes up and down around the outside, and a spring assembly moves up and down, and it causes the horses to go up and down, or the characters. It does not have to be horses, necessarily. This one doesn't. This, this one is uh, all independently driven, which is rather unique. It's the first time I've seen it, and I can see why they don't do that anymore because of the extreme cost. 
Here's the inside. Every single horse in here has its own motor and circuitry. See it all? So you got a circuit board for the lights, and then you have a motor. It's all driven through this ribbon cable. That one. From this circuit board, which gets us power from those two rotors. So, very unique. This, let's set this out of the way a little bit more. This whew, has a large motor down here that drives this pulley. And we have another circuit board in the bottom. And, ooh, look at that. So I'm going to take this off so you can see it. We're going to check all the gears and see if we have a busted gear, and that's why it's intermittently spinning. So. And it has a really large speaker. It has a 16 ohm, 3 watt speaker, which is also not standard anymore. Uh, so I'm going to base this thing is probably at least 20 years old. 16 ohm speakers aren't very common, haven't been common in a very long time. At least for animatronics. So, so we got four Phillips screws recessed down these pillars. And there's one, and they're long screws, so I guess you got to make sure they're really all the way out. seen some moisture and we might have a bad component. I'm going to look at it all real quick and then I'm going to show you what I see. Okay. So here is, <laughs> that makes it easier, here's the circuitry. Blob chip, you got your, which controls the pretty much everything. You got your discrete components that help with the timing, the sound. There's your sound chip right there. But this angled capacitor is rusty. And the bottom is actually bulged, not the top. Usually a capacitor bulges up here. Oh, that's why they have these cuts in them. This one, the bottom is bulged out. So that might be posing some of the intermittent problem. This capacitor isn't flat, but it's not fully domed, so it's probably on its way as well. And the other capacitors and components look okay, but I have a questioning these two right here. So, but before we check those out, let's also check out the gears. gears are right up here. Now this reinforcement bar that keeps these parallel to keep the tension of this pulley is also split. Uh, let's see. This has been used a lot. These teeth are really, really worn. A normal skier, you look at it from its profile, they're cylindrical. This gear right here, which is one of the drive gears, is concaved. It's been worn in really well. So, we might be slipping. But we have two standard flat gears, two worm gears. And that's it. Everything else, as far as tension goes, the, the bars, the reinforcements, the brackets all look good. It's just the one on the top is cracked, which I don't have replacements for, but 
you can make one or possibly 3D print one. But since it's only cracked on the one side and these use a, a brass uh, bushing in the plastic, I'm just going to glue the plastic back together. I'm going to clean it out, get the debris out because uh, it's orange so it has debris in it such as uh, the grease or uh, material from the belt and then I'll put some Gorilla Glue in there to help it bond. Let's uh, putting tension on this to see if any of these gears slip and surprisingly none of them do but nonetheless we're here we're going to take this apart we'll see what the inside looks like or at least I'll be able to show you because I can see it um, so that way you as the person at home that might have it can see what is in there so you know what might break so if you have a problem with rotation Something down here is let go. So there's the brass bushing that's pushed through, and there's the fracture on the one side, and the other side's fine. So fill that with glue, clean it out, fill it with glue, and it should be completely functional. Just inspecting the two pulleys. I'm assuming those are going to be perfect because they're mass. Bigger things don't break as easy. I'm also checking this little gear that's pressed on, making sure that we have good teeth and there's no cracks showing. This belt, I'm assuming you would have to go get from the Mr. Christmas guy in Florida, or uh, you could try and match this belt up from different uh, conveyor drive belt styles. This gear does have a small crack in the nose. Uh, screwdriver. Right there. There's just a small fracture. Same thing, I'm going to clean it off, and we're going to fill this crack with glue right here. Because it's not on the teeth, it's just on the nose. You can see the grease. It's all dark on the inside, and this grease is yellow. This grease is hard. This grease is still pliable. Uh, this grease, because of its color, I'm going to assume is probably a graphite grease. Um, just because most graphite greases are that color and that consistency, which I do actually have. So we'll probably put that back on the shaft. Here is the transfer mechanism from the motor. The motor comes up right here with this worm gear, goes to this straight gear, which then goes back to this worm gear that drives that straight gear, which then pulls the pulleys around, and voila, you have your motion. So this has a much smaller gear box assembly than most, which is nice. Uh, less components, less to break. I think in this one, the majority of the issue is just on that board on the top. Same thing, they use the brass bushings. That is one thing that Mr. Christmas is really good at, at least the older ones were. They used bushings on everything. Prolongs the life. And this gear is in good shape other than its groove. There's no cracks. But what I'm talking about is it's gonna be really hard to see on camera. If you look at this gear this way, it's a cylinder. When you look at this gear this way, it has an hourglass appearance in the center. That's from running on this gear this entire time. There's no fractures in it. It's still pressed on. It just has a lot of use. And this gear, this gear looks good too. Yeah. Mechanism wise, or drive wise, this thing's fine. Uh, it has some wearing parts. 
It's going to need a little uh, lubrication, which will I'll relubricate this. If you notice, I do most of my relubrications when it's spinning. That way, the gear itself can pull the lube into it. I'll have to go and get the graphite lube. I don't keep that in the house. I need that outside in my shed, my shop. It's usually used, I use it for um, door locks. Door locks on cars, door locks on your house. So. So I'm going to say the majority of the issues with this is going to be from that rotor plate. But what I want to do next is see what the voltage is that's coming out of here. And then put that voltage directly to these rotor plates and make sure that everything functions correctly before I reassemble this. Plus I need to go out and get the, the lube for it. If everything functions correctly, then it's probably just the rotor plate. If it doesn't, um, then we know there's other issues on this top circuit board. This bottom board, I'm going to pull out my capacitor tester and I'm going to test those two capacitors as well. But first thing I want to do, actually this will test capacitors as well. Uh, one of the nice things about a multimeter is if they're a true multimeter, they can test multiple things. That's the reason they're called a multimeter. But I do have a capacitance meter that's its sole purpose in life is to check capacitors and inductors. That might quiet up with a uh, new lubrication. Hmm. That's pretty good. I'm getting 13 volts out of an 8 volt power supply. Listen to that torque of that motor. Yep. Let's move this out and bring this top piece in. Now at the moment, my uh, power supply is at 8 volts. So I'm just going to start at 8 volts and see if anything happens. Everything's working. At least on this, I can't see these horses in the back. Slipped. So the rotor is good. It's sending good power to the components below. So my problem, for the most part, is going to be uh, the power going through that rotor into each of these panels. So it's either a bad connection at the rotor because it's worn, or it's a bad connection because of those capacitors that are uh, potentially bad. But all the horses and all the lights, because when I was checking, I was making sure that all six lights, because there's six lights on each panel, um, were functioning. Let me see, is there a way for me to show you without pinching a horse? There we go. So, 
slipped again. And there are six lights. Three, 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 three. But, see? Gotta quit slipping. But that's why the meter has a fail safe in case you short it out. Or excuse me, the power supply. So. Bring this back in and let's check these capacitors. Now, helps you don't drop your meter. All right. All right, meters back together. So if I go over here into this section on my meter, it goes to defaults to ohms. So if I hit select, it's now in diode. Hit it again. I now have audible ohms. And if I go one more time, I have capacitance. And that's that symbol in the upper corner. Right now it says the air is giving me 0.2 nanofarads of capacitance between the two leads. Both these capacitors are 2200 microfarad at 16 volts. And let's see if I can get a good connection on these guys. First one, and I'm touching the solder pads on the other side. these guys are any good I'm not getting the correct the correct capacitance so let me take this board off to make it slightly easier because I'm fighting uh, with this plastic housing board is held on with three screws it looks like two in the outer corners and one in the center on this side This way, I, what I was doing is I was touching these pads right here. There's, uh, there's gunk on this circuit board. I'm going to have to wipe it down with um, some rubbing alcohol as well. Uh, do You can do that anytime as long as you don't have power going through it. So make sure you get rid of your power. And then you can uh, wipe the circuit board down carefully with some rubbing alcohol. Um, again, I use the higher percentage. I recommend nothing below like 91 for doing circuitry because the percentage that isn't in there is using water. And all I'm doing now is I'm going to add a little fresh solder so I get a better connection for my leads. Uh, and this will also burn off any coating. Sometimes they coat these where uh, they put a very thin layer of a, like a waxy substance on them. Usually it's to keep moisture out. So the fresh solder will blend with the old solder, give me good connection, and it's hot enough to melt through any coating on the circuit board. That way I can ensure I'm doing this correctly. So on both of these capacitors, this pin on the outer edge that's on this common bar is negative. So I'm getting 0.12 nanofarads, and this one is coming up as 0.11. So I'm going to 
to say these two capacitors have bit the dust. This one I'm definitely going to say is bad because it's spongy and the bottom is blown out. And I need to see if I have some capacitors lying around. I should. It's a pretty standard size. We're going to get these replaced. And I'll show you with a good capacitor once I find my, uh, once I dig out my capacitors to replace this, the reading of a good capacitor. Bear with me for a few moments while I go find the bucket of capacitors and dig out some 2200 microfarads. Okay, <laughs> I just went through all my capacitors and surprisingly, I only have one because I've been using so many of them. So this is a 25 volt 2200 microfarad. These are 16 volt 2200 microfarad. The higher voltage is fine. You never want to go below the voltage they have as long as the microfarads are the same. This is a capacitance tester. As you can see, it just has nano, microfarads, and then Henry's. That's the H for inductors. So uh, that's all this is designed to do. If you put this across power, you'll blow the meter up. And if you don't want to use the leads and you have long enough leads on your component, you can plug them in right there. So just so you have an idea of what a capacitance tester is. It's a specialty tool that 90% of the people out there will never need. Uh, I found one at a pawn shop that worked, and I figured, heck, I'm going to buy it. Just so I, uh, I have one. And I use it here and there. And so, but yes, this is a capacitance meter, not a multimeter. This is a multimeter. So it can do volts, AC and DC, hertz, percentages of power. You can do your ohms, your diodes, your capacitors. You can do amperage, multimeter, and it does graphs. That's the reason it does graphical. So it's a more fancy meter. This is a very specific meter. Um, unfortunately, um, this is higher than the meter. It won't go up to what this is. So. I can't show you the exact number, but since I only have one, I'm going to take this one that's uh, bulged and the bottom is all spongy, and I'm going to replace it with this one. This one's also a lot larger, so I'm not going to fully desolder it from the board because this has very short leads on it um, because it won't fit flush between the blob chip board in its space, because the blob chip board actually covers the capacitor. Kind of a crappy design, I guess. Screw up on the uh, engineer's part. And I'll show you what I mean. First I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get rid of this capacitor that's uh, bulged. So the part that bulges on the bottom, it's it's also really spongy. I can push the disc in. There's a black disc right there. Um, but the, it should be cylindrical, not tapered up. So they don't last forever. But on the bottom side, I'm going to zoom in for this. The circle for the board actually is overlapped by the blob chip. Focus. So looking straight down, there's the circle, which is why that one's flat. You notice the corner of this board is covering that circle, which is why this one was elevated and kicked off at an angle. Yeah. This should have been a little closer to these, uh, this writing, this text here. And then the capacitor would fit fine. But the replacement, focus, is taller. And fatter. But if you notice, the bottom 
if it'll focus. Come on. Other than the plastic's torn, uh, this plastic sheet that covers the a metal capacitor is flat. And if you look at this one, you can see the bulge. And then it's been leaking. So they don't last forever. Capacitors are very easy to replace. You just got to make sure you get the right... Uh, Wrong way. The right uh, micro or nanofarad, and then the voltage. Again, if you have a 16 volt, you can replace with a 25. If you have a 16 volt and you put a 12 in there, you're going to blow the capacitor. So, and capacitors are generally polarized. If you saw on this board, there's a white spot on the actual. Uh, board, a white spot indicates negative. I'm gonna actually uh, use a little flux. It's not adhering very well. I'm also going to put a little flux on the capacitor. So. So, that white spot is for the negative side, which most capacitors are um, polarized. And I know you're thinking, oh my god, that thing's huge, it's going to get in the way. There's a lot of room in here. Um, I can still bend this back over the circuit board to go the other direction, but I want to see how it fits before I do that. So I'm going to screw this back in real fast. If you have a house and it has a bad discrete component, such as a transistor or capacitor, resistor, inductor, you can replace them. You might have to buy a hundred of them at a time, because most components aren't sold in packs of one. Usually sold in multi-packs. The smaller the component, the bigger the multi-pack. This Capacitors, the last time I bought capacitors, which I'm going to get some more since I'm, I'm out of the 2200s. Uh, the last ones I bought, I bought as a pack of 25. I needed like six. And the smallest pack I could find that would fit my need was 25 of them. So yeah, that capacitor is completely fine. It's not in the way of anything. Motor still works. Alright, so I'm going to screw this back together. I'm going to clean this off and I'm going to go grab some graphite lube and then we're going to slide this back down. So, shall I return in just a moment. You don't need me to see me how to clean it since I already showed you how I did this one. It's going to be very similar for here. And you know how to run a screwdriver. So, I'm going to screw down wipe down, 
go get some lubrication, come back and we'll get this thing lubed and put back together and see if it works. All right, shaft is cleaned. The inside of the pulley has been cleaned. No more black. Uh, and the nose of that's been glued, like I said I was going to. The crossbar is currently in a vise with some glue, so it can squeeze that crack together since I cleaned it out, which makes the crack slightly larger. So, all right, and let's start the reassembly process. So we know that goes there. Make sure that's lined up. All right, so she's nice and stiff. This is graphited fluid. Tells me to have it on upside down. Put some on the inside. Stuff has a very distinctive odor. There we go. Oh, that spins beautifully. Just to ensure it's in there, I'm going to put another couple of drops. You can get any type of graphite lock fluid. Um, this is from Lockies because I said I use it for door locks. Door locks and uh, for cars too, car doors, trunks, etc. It works really good. See, that thing spins beautifully. But we need to lubricate these gears right here. I'm not going to use the graphite stuff. And there's a reason. is This stuff is thin. You can see a little puddle I made around the top here. And I don't want it pouring inside that motor. The biggest failure of motors, especially on Limax, is the lubrication liquefies drips inside the motor, shorts it out. So, I'm going to use a regular grease. This is a regular grease that comes in these little packets. And this stuff has a really high temperature. This is also conductive of electricity. It uh, is a dielectric grease. It's an all-purpose dielectric grease. I, I don't understand that, but it is what it is. There we go. You quieted it down a little. When you heard it go super quiet, that's when a big chunk of the grease went through the gears and they separated for a second. So, now let's uh, put this drum back on. Okay, yeah. The drum has a cam, meaning it's got a, a key. It's got a flat spot. You can't put it on wrong. But, 
and the wires might get in the way. black wire came out just fine. It's this red wire. And it probably also helps to um, put that crossbar back in and screw this down. Getting ahead of myself. So I was going to do that when I paused the camera and I forgot. I was too busy looking for my grease. Too many of these things use graphite grease or graphite oil. Um, it's not something I'd just tell you to go out and buy and have on hand if you're going to do these. Uh, I think this is only the second one I've ever come across that's used a graphite lubricant. Graphite does work really well, but it uh, isn't 100% necessary. Okay, that's the one that's missing. decide to get some graphite um, just don't use it around the motor drive you don't want that stuff getting inside the motor you don't use it on anything that's electrical because it does conduct electricity and it's chunky so it will uh, uh, act like sandpaper so fill it with glue and then you might be able to see the glue bubble so that crack doesn't continue to spread and what I do is I, uh, I clean it out with an exacto knife to scrape to good plastic get some of that dirty plastic off uh, dab it with some alcohol let it dry and then carefully opened up the crack just a little bit use the yellow cap gorilla glue that has the brush put a few brush strokes inside put a glob on the outside and then put it in a vise to hold it together. Now that's a lot better. It won't fall apart now. Alright, so... What I'm going to do is see if this helps. I'm just going to shove the wires inside of the threaded shaft to... Um, Try and keep them up like that so I can drop the drum back on for take two. Just gotta find that key. Now we're going to apply that uh, dielectric grease on these plates. This is a new brush. It's not the same brush I used for the uh, flux. And I'm just going to 
put a coating on. It doesn't have to be thick since it's going to be wiped by the contacts, but you want to coat the entire plate. This will promote lube for it to slide on. It will promote uh, conduct conductivity for the electric and will inhibit rust and corrosion. If you saw these plates aren't corroded, they were just really dirty because of all the dust. I live in Arizona, it's pretty much just dust. Our air is nothing but dust. And now we're going to slide the uh, rotor assembly on. These are keyed as well for the wires, and I was off, so I gotta do it again. There's a little groove for the wires to feed in. There we go. So, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. keep tension on it, but you need to put the nut on. Put the wires in their respective grooves and then tighten this thing down. Horses are working, still having intermittent problems. I'm wondering if one of the motors is going bad. Other than the no it's got a really noisy motor in the center. I'm wondering if that uh, shallow gear is causing the noise. I'm watching the rotor because the, 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 it's not flat, so it's going it goes up and down a hair. But I'm checking the contacts to see if they're lifting because right now it's working fine again, except for that grinding sound from the main drive, which is quieter since it's got new lubrication. I think I think it's 
relatively repaired now. And let it run for a while just to make sure. Uh, now that it's it's reseeding and is digging itself a new track with the new dielectric grease. Also, I rotated these, because inside each one of these pins is a spring, and springs always have that end where it's got a flat piece of spring metal that's sharp, and I think that might have been stopping the springs from keeping even tension, because once I rotated them, they're not working fine. I've had that happen before where the springs have gotten cockeyed and caused the rotor to not, the rotor contacts not to have good tension. Uh, how's the volume sound? Where's that volume knob? Once everything's seated, let's get the volume down so you can hear better. I think once everything's seated, with the springs reseeding and the lubrication doing its job, as far and the dielectric grease, I'm not having any jittery motion. It's nice and smooth as you can see. All the lights are still working, both the flashing lights that are on the outside, the green, red, and yellow, as well as the warm white lights that are pointing down on top of the horses. Uh, she is working good. Sound sounds good. Speaker is not blown. I had it up to full volume and it didn't uh, crackle or pop. Um, I am going to let it run though, just in case the other capacitor is bad. But all the lights are flashing. Usually capacitors are used for timing, noise suppression, and, well, the flashing lights. Uh, but this one, like I said, is bulged and spongy, which isn't good for a capacitor. Matter of fact, I was working on a car yesterday that was getting crackling sounds in the external speakers, and that was due to a blown capacitor inside the uh, audio box. So it does happen because it was used for suppression, so it was picking up the engine noise. All right. Well, to put it back together, I'm just going to get the hot glue gun heated up. I'm going to put a little dab of glue right there and then put the top on which is a single screw in the center and I'm going to take the other one apart which you saw how to do it pop break the glue unscrew the nut desolder the wires you can cut them but you're going to have to re-adhere them which you're going to require solder for that pull the drum off and then you can check everything independently inside which we know that all the motors all the lights work you can send 8 volts DC to the two rotating pads on the top. Um, outer ring is negative, inner ring is positive. To test each of the horses, you know, just set on the bench and, or your table and test it. You can technically use a 9 volt and do the same thing. If you took a 9 volt at an angle and did it, it should do the exact same. Uh, where is that? Where is the switch? Right there. So, on a 9 volt, the smaller one is positive, the fatter one is negative. So, if you were to see, so you can use a 9 volt to test the rotor pad too, as you saw it started rotating just from a 9 volt. So, you can use a 9 volt to test it as well. I'd recommend testing it with 
without the power wires from the bottom coming up because you're sending power backwards. I would only test it with these disconnected. Um, but I wanted to give you a visual representation of, you can test it with a nine volt battery when you're using an eight volt unit like this, or a nine volt unit, or even some 10 volt units that are DC, you can test with a nine volt battery. Uh, nine volts are really strong uh, for their, their little size. So if you don't have a power supply, like I have over here off camera, and I have one over there and one two over there, and I have one in the other room because I got lots of them. Uh, they all have different amperage ratings, which is why, and voltage ratings, which is why I have so many. Um, you can use a 9 volt. And something that's between 8 and 10 volts, you don't need to resist the power. But if you're testing a 4.5 volt uh, house, 9 volts going to destroy some stuff. It might uh, burn out your lighting or your chip or what have you. So don't use a 9 volt on smaller, lighter duty animatronics. But as you saw on this, if you don't have a power supply and you want to test to see if it's just a bad connection up here on your rotor, clean it off, use a 9-volt, tap it. I would disconnect one of these either by lifting it and putting something underneath it or just desoldering it or cutting the wire just so you run this and not the motor on the bottom. Because again, when you put power here, it goes backwards into the system below. Uh, I didn't do it for very long. As you saw, nothing is damaged. Um, there's pretty resilient because we're not running a huge amount of power. So, uh, of course, when you do use a nine volt, because it doesn't have the amperage capacity, it's not, these lights aren't very bright. They're really dim and they're flickery because a nine volt has very little power. While this is putting out one amp, a nine volt only puts out, I think like an eighth of an amp or a 10th of an amp. So it's not going to give you long durations on a nine volt battery. So. But that is the Mr. Christmas carousel thing. Uh, this is also keyed, meaning it can only go on one way. Like that. So I appreciate you watching. If you have any questions, comments, or what have you, just leave them below. I try to answer as many as I can, as fast as I can. And uh, in the near future, probably right after the beginning of the year, I don't know when this is going to go up. Um, so we're going to start having a link tree through Amazon on uh, the Amazon affiliate stuff. So that way, if you need to buy something, there'll be a link uh, below uh, the videos. And then we're going to try and do like a pin comment or a section on our Facebook page and so on. So. One more test. The reason I screw the top on before gluing it is I want to make sure that the tension of the top doesn't change its rotation. Nope, we're still good. So. Test every piece. So, Thanks for watching this really long video on this carousel. Until the next one, have a good one. Quick addendum. This is the other one taken apart. I had to replace that gear. You might be able to see it's a big old crack. That's why it wasn't spinning. So the kits that I normally buy off of Amazon have the gear with the wrong size shaft. So I just drilled it out. Now this pulley has also got little hairline fractures. So I filled the bottom of it with super glue and I'm going to do the top as well. You can see those dark lines. That's for the fractures. So this other one, the reason it didn't spin is it has a broken gear and the uh, pulley is starting to break apart. So I'm just going to fill the top of the pulley and the bottom of the pulley with glue to fill in those cracks. The bar that goes across here, like the other one had, it also is split in the same spot. So it is currently in the vise, being squeezed together with the glue inside of it after I cleaned it out with an X-Acto knife. So. Quick addendum on the second one. The second one, everything else is fine. The top doesn't have near as big of a groove, but I still cleaned it off with alcohol. And I'll put new grease on it. And then I already put new uh, graphite lube on here. And I have new lube on the bottom gears. So now I just need to wait for this bar to dry and then fill this cup here. And we're good. So, quick addendum on the second one. Reason didn't spin, broken gear. Which, uh, luckily, that K2 
kit I usually get uh, has two of them in there. So until the next one or the next video, have a good one.